Well, thanks, uh, Dale, and, and thank you, everybody, for uh, allowing me to be here today. It's a big honor and uh, excited to come back to Kansas. Last time I was in Manhattan was RMC of 2011. I wasn't old enough to go to Aggieville. And then uh, I came down here one time on a, a shuttle trip to bring some, some, some steers down for a livestock judging contest. And uh, much like Logan, when Dale asked for me to give this talk, I came up with a title and, and maybe it changed. It could probably be you know, managing growth through energy supply and, and, and anabolic agents. But this is what I came up with. And Dr. Blasi on the way down, Alfredo and I com commend you because one of the only programs I've ever been on where I wasn't being harassed for my PowerPoints or my proceedings. And so he just told us, he believed in us and, and we're here today. And so the title of today's talk, well, you've already read it, it's the appropriate use of steroidal implants during backgrounding and stalker phases, impacts on growth performance and carcass outcomes upon harvest. Uh, a little bit, I want to tell you a little bit about what we're doing and where we're at. Uh, when I told my, uh, my girlfriend at the time that I was about to interview for a job in South Dakota, and she'd spent her whole life in the, the Southeast and, and in Texas, it was, why are we going to South Dakota? And uh, I, I didn't have these data quite yet, uh, but now when I have to justify what we're doing in South Dakota, I tell her about this. And, and she's a, a big supporter, and, and uh, we have a lot of fun. Uh, it, it's, South Dakota is a great place to live. You know, um, every fall we're going to buy wean calves, and I just sit at my desk, and there's strings of, of thousands of heads of cattle going through one sale barn in one weekend and when you need to go pick up cattle to conduct your research that are of similar biotype, similar weight and raised the right way, cattle from the upper Midwest and Northern Plains certainly fit the bill. But within Sioux Falls South, within a 150 mile radius of Sioux Falls, South Dakota and all of the rest of the state of South Dakota, there's about 1.8 million head of cattle in feedlots. Now, these data aren't going to be on the USDA report proper. You've got to go through and dig through the NAS surveys or NAS reports because a lot of these feedlots are under 1,000 head. So they're underreported, but they're certainly there. And uh, when I go and present this to my buddies in the 308 Coordinating Committee, they're like, Zach, you're taking credit for Northwest Iowa, Northeastern Nebraska, and I totally get it. But when I got to sit and talk to some of our students about why living in South Dakota means you can still have a great opportunity in the confinement cattle business, I bring this up. And the yards look a lot different than uh, you know, where I did most of my uh, advanced training. I did a bachelor's degree at Texas Tech and my PhD at Texas Tech. Funny story, Dale calls me the young buck, uh, but the first week of my PhD, I... Uh, Logan was finishing up his bachelor's degree last year, last semester of his undergrad, and I actually helped him do his first blood assay. So I guess I'm getting a little age on me too now yet. But uh, one-time capacity, and this was a, a pretty modest survey that Alfredo and I conducted. Oh, this was COVID. And Alfredo, I saw you were doing research at the farm during COVID because it said 2020. But we were sitting around bored, and I told Alfredo about this wild, wild idea, and he said, let's do it. And we did it, and then we got the funding from the government, and then we had to do it. Uh, we learned a lot throughout this. Uh, we, act, you know, one thing I didn't know, I grew up in Central Florida going to skateboard parks. I didn't realize you don't just go ask people how many heads of cattle they got at their farm because it's how many the permit says, right? Uh, but we asked them, and they didn't have to disclose this, but we said, how big are your feedlots? Uh, and a one-time capacity on average in, in this region kind of that circle is about 1,780 head of cattle on feed at any given time. A lot of these would be backgrounding yards and some finishing yards, and they would range in size from 500 head to about 5,000. We uh, practice at two facilities. I didn't include this, but I wanted to show Dr. Cool, uh, and it's kind of hard to see now. This is the Ruminant Nutrition Center. It's, uh, I'd call it our flagship station. It, it looks pretty shiny and nice, and it's where we go and show people what we're working on. And then down in Beersford, that's the ugly pig that we put lipstick on, but it's a very functional facility. Uh, we've got 24 pins down here, nine undercover, and this is a 56 head, 56 pin research facility, and it's all located right here on the I-29 corridor. 
Now within Experiment Station proper, there's other feedlot facilities across the state. We've got a grow yard facility out in uh, western South Dakota at the Cottonwood Field Station and it's actually the oldest range livestock experiment farm in the United States. Some really interesting stuff they do out there is uh, they've got a 60 year old con continuous study that's never ever stopped. It started post World War II and they look at differing stocking densities uh, of cattle applied to those pastures during summer grazing season. But now I got to talk about uh, uh, managing growth and using technology and uh, kind of the same thing that Logan shared on cow size uh, but something's happening okay and so when I think about my predecessor Dr. Robbie Pritchard he got his job in 1983 average carcass weight was somewhere around uh, 600 pounds or so and when he retired it was 900 pounds and so when you sit there and you apply a percent increase to that you're just like holy smokes uh, what in the world am I going to get done in our career or in, in the time that I have the opportunity to do this work but it we've enhanced production efficiency from every cow that grazes in the prairie we take a look at steer hawk carcass weight from 1962 to today the average annual increase is about four pounds from 1962 to 1992 it was considerably less it was still meaningful about 2.74 pounds of carcass weight each year and then from 1992 to today the slope of this line is about six pounds six and a half pounds and we could sit here and talk about from 1962 to 1992 this was the era of, of primarily estrogenic based implants improvements in, in, in feed additive administration and utilization and an improvement in, in some of the cattle genetic types from 1992 till today this is the era of being able to use combination androgenic and estrogenic implants feeding an application of beta adrenergic agonist and again yet uh, an improvement in the mature size uh, of cattle another thing that I didn't have this in my slide till this morning but Alfredo queried us when we got in the car and asked about calf weaning weight and I said hey I have a slide deck for that uh, Dr. Pritchard wasn't very uh, at least as a student he didn't seem too sentimental about many things he was kind of a uh, a whip cracker and, and drove us pretty hard but he did keep every scale ticket from every set of calves he ever bought right off the ranch and I asked him why he did that he said well throughout the course of my career we went from big old floppies to big old things you stick in the computer to jump drives to the cloud and he said every time the data storage changed he had a hard time going back and finding his old files so we had a paper copy which is still why even yet I make all my grad students hand record every feed delivery each day uh, we're not going to go into computer cloud black box business just yet but the rate of the the accumulation of weaning weight in the cow herd at least from two ranches in western South Dakota that have been fed at the RNC continuously from 1991 to 2017 now I'll tell you a story when I got there in 2018 I didn't get to buy these calves because they were still they were spoken for yet uh, when, when Pritchard left he went and found some other people to feed these cattle and so that forced me to go out and find a new rancher to connect with and we have and I, I, don't, I don't include those data here because they're a different biotype of cattle they're Charlotte Angus crosses that we feed primarily now these would be uh, Angus calves or Angus, cow, Angus cows bred to uh, continental Angus crosses, so a Sim Angus or Limmy Limflex bull. But it's about three pounds per year that we've increased weaning weight of calves, at least on those two ranches in western South Dakota. Another thing I'll point out here is there's some pretty good years and there's some pretty bad years. Uh, first time I did this, I had uh, on the x axis year, uh, but that gives you a really sketchy intercept so I scaled it down to year 1 through 21 and so we've gone from 566 to about 625 more or less in the past 25 years on that particular ranch but I'll point out here this dot here this year here was a year after a pretty significant drought in western South Dakota and so what happened he cut hard he got rid of the cows that that weaned lightweight calves and the subsequent year of that was calves that weaned considerably heavier. 
And so when you take a look at that, and, and the slope of the line is very important, but it's also interesting to know the history or the story about those outliers or the ones that change over time or you know, the ones that pull the average up uh, of the overall population. So now I want to talk to you all not about implants. Uh, a few years ago, talking about implants was pretty fun. Well, now we've got specific labels that explicitly state what we can do with or within a stage of production. And I'm still just about as confused as anybody, so I'm not going to sit here and tell you all about that. But there are some pretty basic, not basic, some very applied principles of managing caloric supply and how we can affect cattle outweight. And that's kind of what I want to demonstrate and discuss with you all today. So we talk about management. We want to talk about ways that we can improve productivity of the carcass or the outweight, the product generated, while still maintaining above average and acceptable carcass quality. All right, we want to get all the weight possible with the least amount of accumulation of external or 12th rib fat, but we want them heavy and big when we harvest them. I'm going to talk about some varying production systems from pretty intensive to very extensive. Talk about uh, a non-scientific uh, assessment of some data I went through looking into age and body weight at a feedlot arrival. And then talk about managing caloric intake from weaning to two-thirds of finished weight and how this affects post-growing phase cattle growth performance and carcass quality. Um, and and kind of enlighten us all on how we can do a little bit more with background in cattle beyond just straighten them out, straightening them out. Now there are some assumptions that need to be made. Um, you know, we can use management to effectively reset or adjust mature weight. And when we say mature weight or AFBW, the AFBW is an acronym for body weight adjusted to 28% empty body fatness. 28% empty body fatness is a very important um, uh, fat content in that it relates to on average when cattle accumulate the choice grade. Now some assumptions here is that uh, cattle are ready at 30% empty body fat. And it, I put the mic closer to my mouth. Sometimes I talk a little soft. And that conventionally managed cattle, okay, and we call this in our system the pushed calf. He's not a calf fed because I don't put him on a finisher the day of weaning or, or within three to four weeks of weaning. But I receive that calf. I grow it with forage and then I finish him. And that calf that comes in somewhere between 575 and 625 spends about 270 days in our feedlot before he is sold as a 1,500 pound steer sometime after the 4th of July. But this pushed calf that was born the previous spring is going to be market ready sometime between 14 and 15 months of age at a body weight similar to his mother or the average of his mother and his father, right? So you use Angus cows that weigh 1,300 pounds. At about 14 to 15 months of age, that calf, if weaned, grown, and finished, and the pushed calf model, if you will, is going to be about the average of his dam and sire or his mother. Now, there's some other important things to remember, and that's the progression of fattening that occurs throughout life. The progression of fat as, as, as a percentage of, of empty... Uh, a percentage of empty body fatness. Now empty body fatness or empty body weight is the weight of the animal less all the contents of the gastrointestinal tract. And that can vary somewhere between 85 and 88 percent of full weight, but it's not just ruminal reticular fill, the four percent pencil shrink that we apply when we do transactions with cattle, but it's the entire GI mass. All right, so you got a third, well, I'm going to use an easier number, you got a thousand pound critter and it's really only 880 pounds of metabolically active tissue. The rest of that is just ingesta that really doesn't have anything to do with how that animal or the, 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 the needs for energy of that critter or protein or other things. But we progress from 4% empty body fatness at birth to 8 to 10% at weaning to 14% at puberty to about 30% at harvest. And we, we need to also discuss what are the priorities of tissues for fuel use. Well, brain gets first dibs on any available energy. 
or the central nervous system, then it's the bones, the GI tract, muscle, and then fat, okay? And so when I have to explain this to kids in, our, in a, in a growth, and de growth and development course or in my feedlot production course, I tell them you, you can't lose and gain brain cells, but you can lose and gain fat cells. And that's how our body prioritizes how these f tissues get to drain the fuel supply to the animal. And then another important thing to remember is, when does puberty occur? Well, puberty occurs, at least in a heifer, when she initiates the ability to, to be reproductively active and maintain a, a pregnancy, all right? It's a, a physiological change in the levels of estrogen and a variety of, of other hormones that they produce from their gonads and from their body fat. It's about 65% of mature weight in a heifer. And one thing that's really profound is, is that a, a cycling heifer, maybe she was only fed forage up until the point in which she began cycling. If you were to go and take an ultrasound probe and probe her ribeye, there's a good chance that she's got small zero zero marbling in her loin, all right? The choice grade. Because the initiation of puberty is set by the accumulation of fat relative to her weight that gets those processes going. I want to talk about a really great study that was doing systems-based research before it was a cool thing. This study's got some age on it now. You know, the, the project was quite long to pull off. It took them 405 days to, to get the last treatment done here. And it was published in 2005. So that tells me that this study was at least initiated in the late 90s, maybe the early 2000s. But what we have here, and here I'm going to talk about age and body weight at arrival into the feedlot. We have an accelerated system. These calves were springborn calves. They were weaned in the fall. They were put into a feedlot, stepped up to a top diet, and they were finished in about 200 days. They were about six months old at feedlot entry. There's another uh, more extensive uh, production system here. This was a fall-born calf. Uh, that uh, entered the dry lot, spent 69 days in a dry lot, so fall-born calf, spent 69 days in a dry lot, went out and grazed uh, pasture for about 100 days, and then spent 167 days in the feedlot, and he was about a year of age uh, when he was harvested. The other one's a spring-born extensive program, and this might be the cattle that are weaned that are a touch lighter. They go into a dry lot situation and, and in preparation for summer turnout to graze summer pastures, they come back into the feedlot sometime in you know, September or October. And these ones are actually quite fun to feed. They, they literally explode when they get in the feedlot. You buy these calves, they weigh 1,000 pounds, and they look like they should weigh 1,200 pounds. And we fed a lot of these cattle, and they do outstanding in the feedlot. Uh, first set of cattle I ever fed that was a 5x5. Five it's five pounds of average daily gain with the feed conversion of under six with some cattle like this. <laughs> Excuse me, but they weighed, uh, spent about 405 days total in the system uh, and, uh, and were about 16 months of age at which time they entered the feedlot. So here's our age at feedlot entry, six, 12, and I said they were a year old when they got their heads cut off. They were actually a year old when they entered the feedlot or 16 months of age at feedlot entry. And this was their initial body weight at feedlot entry. So 550, 630, or 840. And here in the brackets, what I have is, and this is merely an estimate, I estimated that they were like 80 pounds at birth. So this is their pre-weaning average daily gain was two, excuse me, pre-feedlot entry average daily gain was either 2.4, two, or one and a half. What I want to point out here is, is that as we decrease the rate of gain prior to feedlot entry, or in other words, the age of which that animal enters the feedlot, we have a pretty substantial increase in the body weight of when we harvest them at a half inch of rib fat. So we range from 1130 for a calf that's born in the spring, goes into the feedlot and is off feed and finished within 200 days. He's not off feed. He's harvested within 200 days of feedlot entry to 1250 to 1350. 
Here's the overall average daily gain of that particular critter would be 28375 or approximately 4 pounds. And then of course the increase in dry matter intake and cattle that are in an accelerated program do have an improvement in dry matter feed conversion but they generate less out weight. Whereas this springborn extensive calf would have a considerably greater uh, here to this number here is about a 10% poorer dry matter feed conversion or 10 to 15% poorer dry matter feed conversion. Really no difference in dress, but a pretty big uptick in carcass weight when we can compare an animal that's older at feedlot entry compared to a younger animal at the time in which they began to be fed a progressively higher energy diet. When we go in and evaluate loin eye area, this is a function of greater carcass weight and there really is no appreciable difference here in ribeye area generated per hundred weight. The other thing I want to point out here is rib fat accumulation. So they were all harvested at the same fat thickness endpoint. The ones that were older at feedlot entry or had a slower rate of gain prior to entry into the feedlot just generated more weight at a common back fat thickness endpoint. And then lastly here, I want to point out that we didn't screw up marbling. Okay, so at least in these studies, the restriction of growth prior to feedlot entry wasn't such that we impeded intermuscular adipose deposition. And this is important. So what were the weights of these critters at feedlot entry as a percentage of their final body weight, the weight, the final shrunk body weight when we shipped them? 50% up to 62% of their final shrunk body weight at feedlot entry. And, and, and this, is, this is important to realize. The next set of slides I'm going to show you is going to be talking about management of caloric supply from 50 to 65% of final shrunk body weight and how that can have some really drastic impacts on the carcass, both weight and quality of the critter that we impose those uh, management strategies to. So it was for weaning is about 50% of, the, of their final shrunk body weight on average. Now this is a data set, uh, excuse me, that last one was accelerated versus extensive, extensive production systems. This is age and body weight at arrival. So when I got to SDSU, I uh, started feeding pins of cattle, obviously. And uh, I said, uh, I use, I, I think I got a good data flow. Uh, it makes sense in my head, but uh, I wanted to get it into an Excel sheet so that other people could use this if they wanted to go back and take a look at what we were doing. And so I started putting all every pen of cattle I ever fed into a data sheet, and before I knew it, I had a couple hundred pens. And then I called Dr. Galleon at Tech, and I said, hey, I'm doing something, look at this. And he's like, oh, Zach, I've got 400 more pens to add to your data set. And I said, well, thank you, sir and uh, it's continuing to grow. This is finishing phase outcomes only. And I classified the calves into three different outcome groups. So all the South Dakota calves were one to three and I classified the Texas cattle as four. And this is what it is, a pushed calf. I call a pushed calf that's a nine month old, eight weight in January at feedlot entry. A backgrounded calf or yearling, this is about a 12 month old critter or a nine weight in April, or a grazed yearling, this is a 16 to 17 month old critter that's about a nine weight in early, uh, late September, early October. Um, and you can see here I had more pins of push calves than I did of backgrounded calf slash yearlings uh, and had a little bit more of the grazed yearling. And then all the cattle that were in the Texas data set were eight weights. That's what they bought and fed at the Burnett Center. And we had 477 pins of those. So what I want to point out here, and I apologize, this slide is in metric. Uh, first time I presented this slide was at ASAS. And so I had to put it in metric. That was when I was still a young buck. I still am a young buck. This year, I refused to present it in metric and I did it in pounds because my brain just thinks a heck of a lot better in the imperial system. But here we are, the pushed calf, and this is their final outweight, final shrunk body weight, finished at 1360 in my data set. The backgrounded yearling calf had about 26 pounds of outweight on that critter, finished at 1386. This grazed yearling, those five by five cattle that do exist out in the wild, 1452 at harvest. 
And then the Texas 8 weight was 1,320 pounds at harvest. Now this is slightly confounded by cattle biotype, okay? The cattle in Texas would have been carrying, oh, I'd say one-eighth to one-twelfth or one-sixteenth of Bosindicus blood, and the cattle we feed in South Dakota should contain zero, but that's not always true. We fed some eared cattle in our day. So what was their weight at feedlot entry as a percentage of their final shrunk body weight? And the pushed calf, when I started them on the finisher, they started being fed a higher energy diet at about 55% of their final shrunk body weight. The backgrounded yearling was about 667% of their final shrunk body weight. This grazed yearling that entered the feedlot as a 16 or 17 month old, was his entry weight was 70% of his final shrunk body weight. And the Texas 8 weight was about 58% of his final shrunk body weight. And these are the incoming weights uh, to the time when we started the finishing phase. So 750, 930, 950, or 760 pounds. Now one other thing I want to point out here, because at this point I was trying to prove how, why feeding cattle in South Dakota was still maybe a better idea than doing it in Texas, because um, there's not a pr very vibrant cattle feeding industry in South Dakota. There is, but there's not a vibrant cattle finishing system. It just, uh, be quite frank with you, makes me angry when we send our really nice, high quality feeder cattle that are a, a highly valued commodity that's an asset produced in our state and then they send them to southwest Kansas to be finished. It blows my mind. And, and I understand maybe y'all like to feed those, but uh, it, it always makes me angry when they go to Texas or Oklahoma to be finished. I'm like, why don't we just feed these things here in the state? And uh, as you can see here, the pushed calf, the backgrounded yearling, the grazed yearling, all of my South Dakota fed cattle had a, about a 10%, 7 to 10% poorer dry matter feed conversion than the cattle fed in the Texas panhandle. Well. One thing about South Dakota is it gets cold in the winter and it gets really hot in the summer. Okay, so we're, we're taking it on both sides, double-edged sword in regards to environmental conditions uh, relative to how those affect cattle growth performance. So one thing about feed conversion that many people don't know, and, and a, even surprisingly many people with advanced degrees in, in beef cattle nutrition are less familiar with the principles of applied energetics. And what I mean by that is, is that observed energy intake is so closely related, should be so closely related to expected energy intake that it's scary. But what does that mean? Well, when I go back and see what a critter gained and what they ate, if that deviates, so observed is what they ate, and the expected is what I think they should have eaten based upon their composition and the, the, the rate of gain, that shouldn't deviate by about more than 5%. And if it does, then I start asking questions like, well, was it cold out? Did you feed an ionophore? Did you have missed implants? All these little things that don't actually reveal themselves in the feed conversion calculation. So when I compared the pushed calf to the Texas 8 weight, they had about a 12% improvement in dry matter feed conversion. But I wanted to know, does this feed to gain response equate to a change in the apparent efficiency of dietary energy utilization? When corrected for the compositional differences between the Texas calf and the South Dakota calf, and whenever I correct for these things and take a look at the observed and expected intake, and so observed to expected intake, in this calculation, a ratio greater than one is actually bad, okay? It means that observed intake was 3% higher than I would have expected them to consume intake based upon the energy content of the diet, based upon, you know, feeding table standards and the, the observed average daily gain. And in Texas, they were 2% better, okay? So they ate less feed relative to what I thought they should have consumed based upon their, their, their gain and the feed standard tables. And when you take a look at it this way, it's only a 5% difference when we compare the two different cattle. So feed conversion is a very important metric when we're talking about things like feed cost to gain.
but it's not always the end-all be-all when we talk about the efficiency of, of production when we go in and, and, and uh, adjust for things related to the composition of gain. So summary, length of time cattle spent at a growth rate closer to the daily gain that allows them to reach their mature body weight at four years of age. So kind of like how you raise their mother. Um, they are larger at their harvest endpoint. So when we overdo it, or not overdo it, but accelerate that rate of gain, to where they achieve their mature weight before their fourth birthday, they're just going to generate a lighter carcass at the same compositional endpoint. And a feed to gain response is not the same as an observed to expected or apparent energy utilization ratio. Now I want to get in here talking about management of growth from weaning to, to finishing, or, or to two-thirds of their finished body weight. And this was actually some data that, that we did when I was a grad student working for Dr. Pritchard and that Ethan did a follow-up study to, and I'm only presenting Ethan's data today. They are, the, in essence, the same. But Ethan fed these cattle from 680 pounds, so about 50% of, you know, they went out at 1,300 pounds, so 50% of their final shrunk body weight to about 65% of their final shrunk body weight. So that was about 881 pounds. And we backgrounded these cattle at two, two and a half, or three pounds a day. Those were the treatment strategies. And as you can see here, there's not a significant difference in initial weight or ending period weight. We didn't totally hit our targets, Dale. We weren't as good at program feeding them as you are, but we got close. Overall average daily gain was two, one, two, six, or two, nine. There was a linear increase in average daily gain. And if they, we fed them to grow more, so they ate more. So we had a linear increase in, in intake. And, and these cattle, we had a linear reduction in, in uh, dry matter feed conversion to be better on the cattle that gained faster. And this was the days they spent on the backgrounding program, 76, 61, or 54. And just want to show you here that these were approximately 65, 66, or 68% of the of the final shrunk body weight target now here's finishing phase growth performance so cattle that were grown faster during the backgrounding phase generated less out weight they had lesser average daily gain they consumed less feed and they actually had poor dry matter feed conversion and what else is really interesting here is that these cattle grown at the slowest background and growth rate spent about the same amount of days on feed in the finishing phase because they had some compensatory or catch-up growth. Uh, a lot of these are, are some of the same principles that, that Dr. Nuttleman was discussing a bit earlier. Here's the cumulative uh, production phase from weaning to finish. If we grow them slower during the backgrounding phase, they have lower average daily gain from weaning to finish. They eat less feed and they do have poor dry matter feed conversion and they spend more days on feed primarily due to the growth restriction applied during the backgrounding phase. What's really cool here is, is to think about how this strategy might work if you're one that retains ownership in your cattle when you sell them. We have a linear increase when we go from three to two in carcass weight. These cattle generated about $22 more, 22 pounds more carcass weight. So I'm going to use easy math right now. That's about $3 a pound. That's $66 in their pocket when they slowed down background and growth rate. Dressing percent uh, had a quadratic response. That's likely, I uh, don't know how to explain that just yet. A linear increase in ribeye area uh, and no difference in rib fat accumulation. What was interesting, and this happened both in the Pritchard study and in the Blom study, was that marbling development, or excuse me, marbling amount was the greatest for the cattle that were backgrounded at the middle growth rate. And this was, first time we saw this, we're thinking, this ain't right, this is a bit counterintuitive. We think marbling's an early developing tissue, only thing we can do is screw it up. But marbling is an intrinsic component of growth, okay? Rib fat is where calories go and we feed cattle more than buffalo eat. It's a place where we store waste fat. But marbling development is a, is a 
steady linear increase throughout the growth rate, the growth curve of cattle. And this is likely due to things like, this is getting pretty nerdy on the meat muscle biochemistry, but that uh, intermuscular adipocytes are the fuel source for things like red and slow twitch muscle fibers, the, the muscle in a loin eye. <clears throat> we had a reduction in uh, yield grade, primarily driven by differences in carcass weight, and we, we, we just about got these uh, harvested at the same empty body fatness. Now what we, we did do though is uh, we did not have a change in AFBW in this particular study, but numerically uh, they were about seven pounds heavier at mature weight. So what I want to point out here is that a lower background in growth rate, enhanced finishing phase growth and efficiency, and altered marbling score. And this gets into, I need a chalkboard to describe this, but think of it as if you feed them more when they're, when they're in the growth, in the growing period, those calories, there's only so much of the pipe that can be filled with calories to go to intermuscular adipose tissue. And once that's kind of bogged up, it's like trying to get out of Aggieville on a game day, you just turn and bust a move and go out another way. And so those calories were going down the pipeline too fast to fill the intermuscular adipose so it, pipeline and they went on and got put on as subcutaneous and waste fat. Now this was a study that a grad student of mine conducted. Uh, you know, this was a study nobody would fund either. And so we got to do a little bit of product testing. And when we do a little bit of product testing, we can use the, the extra pins available that aren't filled up to answer questions that are important or, or things we think are useful. And so in South Dakota, it's very common for us to do what I call a two-click grow-finish program. We get them, we, we wean them as balling calves, they'll go through a 42 or 56 day receiving period, and that's just where we straighten them out, and then we feed them forage until they become inefficient on forage, and then we transition them over to a finishing diet, and we try to get them out of there in about 270 days. And so what I was interested in doing was looking at a, what I call a one-click, so feed one diet all the way throughout, or to feed a growing diet initially, and then a finishing diet for half of the feeding period. So what happened? We fed a 16 roughage diet all the way through from 30, uh, 42 days after weaning to finish, or we fed a 25 roughage grower for 100 days and then transition them to a seven roughage finisher for 100 days. And if you take 25 and seven, that's 32 divided by two, it's 16. So I fed them the same roughage level throughout the feeding period. I just altered the way I delivered those calories. I was managing growth differently through energy supply. And how close did we get? Pretty close. Final roughage and, and final energy values were in essence not different. The cattle fed the one diet throughout ate 16.7 points of roughage. The cattle fed the two click ate 16 and a half percent roughage. I'm going to go through these pretty quick because I'm standing between y'all and Bill's Rocky Mountain Oysters. Uh, but no difference in initial weight. At the end of the growing period, cattle fed the 16R, which was a more energy dense diet, weighed more. These 25R weighed less. I'll show you in a second, there was no difference in intake, so that's why they weighed less. They did have poorer feed efficiency. And at the end of the feeding period, these cattle on the seven roughage for the last period caught up and uh, we, in essence, harvested them at a pretty similar final body weight. Here's average daily gain, was about 10% greater for the 16R during the first 100 days. Here's average daily gain the last 100 days was about 10% greater for the cattle on the 25R switch to 7R, and cumulatively, they were the same. I was surprised that intake did not differ uh, between these two groups, but perhaps it is that 16 points of roughage is just not enough to break intake over at the end of the feeding period to where fill limits intake. And you can see here, overall, cumulative intake was identical. And so this resulted in, in about a 10% difference in feed conversion within each period 
but cumulatively no difference. Now, I went through this whole talk to, talk to show you all when we quit feeding roughage in our shop. Now, I got it easy. I got to train grad students, so we got to pull blood, take muscle biopsies, do things to measure and create dependent variables so we can publish manuscripts. Uh, so we weigh them every 28 days. And with every 28-day weights, I've got a really nice insight into when they start slipping on feed conversion on a forage-based diet. And what just so happens to be on this line, the dash line is the two-click, and I use that as my base. I called it 100%. The solid green line is the cattle on the 16R. Okay, and so they were about 10% more efficient until this point here, which is when we made the diet switch. Okay, but they, re they remained poor. This is a fluke, I think. Could be differences in residual fill on that interim weigh date. But this inflection point where feed conversion on the 16R got poor was at about 70% of their final shrunk body weight. So cattle can be grown on forage and feed conversion can be quite nice until you get them to about 70% of their mature weight. And then it's time to pull the trigger and get them on a finisher. No differences in carcass traits in this particular study. And so when I think about this and try to tie all this together, we need to think about the influence of puberty as a reference point in growth and how that, when that changes, is about the time when we have an inability to maintain adequate dry matter feed conversion on a forage-based diet. Additionally, lower background and growth rate enhanced efficiency during the finishing phase because they had catch-up growth. And it, the same thing happened uh, in our particular study here, except mine was confounded by diet. And Ethan Blom's study, they were on the same diet all the way through. There's one other thing that I didn't point out here, and I'll, I'll just go back, it's on my last slide, is this marbling deal. In this particular study, all the cattle were given a sin of excess. So when we got these data back, the first thing that popped into our head was, what if we'd have just given the cattle grown at two pounds a day a less potent implant? We could have given them a Cinevex C or a Ralgro. So we still don't know how anabolics relative to the degree of calorie restriction might influence marbling development. So in my head, and I haven't had time to redo this study for Ethan, is to look at implant strategy relative to these differing background and growth rates. So give them a less potent implant and see if we can keep all the carcass weight yet, but up that marbling score on those cattle that were growing at the slowest background and growth rate. All right, bear with me here. Now we're going to discuss the role of anabolic implants. It's not a new technology at all. We've been using these compounds for 65 plus years. Uh, and uh, as a researcher, implants are a pretty fun tool to work with because they always work. All right? If I need to do something and show a meaningful response, implants typically get the job done. <clears throat> now, there's new rules about how you can only use one within a given stage of production unless explicitly stated that a re implanting, that re -implanting is allowed. Now we can classify these into female, male hormones and pregnancy hormones. We have natural, synthetic, and, and, and uh, estrogen-like at least when we talk about xeranol. Uh, typical implant formulations these days contain estradiol with some alone or in some combination with an androgen and a progestin. Typical responses to implants are are a function of caloric supply. 6% in calf increase in average daily gain, 15% to 15 or so in stalkers, and up to 20% in feedlot cattle. And uh, when we talk about this, implants generally enhance average daily gain, but only marginally impact intake. And so what we see is about a 10% improvement in dry matter feed conversion when implants are used. Implants increase carcass weight, dress percent and ribeye area and like I said there, these technologies have been around for many many years uh, from originally oral diethylstabesterol to the DES implant 
to estradiol benzoate progesterone implant for steers. This is a Cine of XS. Same implant made in 1956 you can buy at your local vet store today. And then we've come in here in the 90s, we got the combination estrogen trimbolone implants to these new longer acting or initial and delayed release implants or what I call delayed release, uh, uh, extended release implants like the, the Cinevex 1 technology. These are approved stalker cattle implants, Cinevex S, H, Compudose, Encore, Ralgro, RevG, and uh, more recently, Cinevex 1 Grower. Now, what do implants do? Well, to put it simple, they change frame size, all right? And it's independent of the effects of diet and nutrition. So all that other stuff I talked about, about slowing growth rate before they enter the feedlot, implants are additive to that. They cause a delay in fattening. Which is why when the first combination TB, well, it was before that, in 1987 after TBA implants and were approved, the Packers were ready to shut it down. They're like, we're getting dark cutters. These things aren't, aren't, don't have enough marbling. Same thing happened again when we got the combination implants approved. Well, turns out when you delay fattening, you just need to feed them a little bit longer so you get them to the same level of fatness as their non-implanted counterpart and then the, the risks associated with reductions in quality grade are kind of out the window. They increase the potential for lean gain. And the reason we can use implants repeatedly, although you're not, I should watch what I say. Repeated implantation doesn't kill the effects of the subsequent implant so long as you're stacking doses, progressively increasing the dose of that implant. Now with things like beta adrenergic agonists, you feed them at the end of the feeding period because the way they work is they're not able to maintain the DNA to protein ratio of the, of the muscle fiber. And again, this gets into some pretty nerdy muscle biochemistry things, but muscle cells are like the largest cell in the body. If you go get a round steak before you hammer it out to make your chicken fry, you can see the individual muscle cell. It's a multinucleated cell and there's a population of cells within that muscle fiber that we call satellite cells. And these are little bitty nuclei that are asleep and they don't really start going to work until they're needed to help maintain that DNA to protein ratio. Which is why we can have something called sustained muscle hypertrophy with implants but not with beta agonist feeding. This is a cartoon uh, that I first saw when I was watching Dr. Pritchard give a talk so it's not mine, uh, but it's uh, the components of the carcass, all right? And when I tell my students this in class, I'm like, what's, what are the components of the carcass? And they get really confused, and I'm like, well, what's in your ribeye steak? It's bone, it's muscle, and it's fat, okay? And then you really want to get them confused. You say, all right, these are the physical components. What are the chemical components? And then you really get to test whether they were paying attention in feeds and feeding, because it's ash, protein, and lipids. All right, so the physical components, not the chemical components, are bone, muscle, and fat. Up top, we've got a non-implanted animal. On the bottom, we have an implanted animal. Remember, first thing I said is implants change frame size. It's little, the, 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 the repeated exposure of estrogen causes long bones to grow. When long bones quit growing whenever I achieve puberty, and I get a huge dump of estrogen from my gonads. Has, everybody, has anybody ever heard of what a eunuch is? It's a castrated male. They're castrated to keep a low, a high-pitched singing voice. Well, they become very large in size. So the hunchback of Notre Dame was a eunuch, and he was a very big individual. If Dale ever keeps mold uh, steers out here for uh, metabolism cattle, you will notice that after a few years they become very large and that's because they had their gonads removed before they ever reached maturity so they're still producing low levels of estrogen from things like their fat tissue and they just get really massive so at puberty we get a huge large dump of estrogen that causes long bone growth to cease kind of the same reason why Ralgro implants haven't taken off in sheep production they work really nice, but they cause fusing of the bone growth plate, and then those lambs will be classified as mutton. 
a big dose of estrogen causes your growth plate, that epiphyseal growth plate, to quit continuing its growth. So the first thing we do here is we change frame size. So we get more bone when we implant an animal. More bone facilitates more skeletal muscle uh, accumulation potential, and we're going to delay fattening here. So bigger bone, more muscle, less fat. That's what this cartoon says. Now, if we're to harvest these cattle at an equal days on feed, this implanted animal is going to be leaner. He's accumulated less fat. He's going to have less marbling because we haven't got him to the weight in which he can achieve the choice grade. And he's got 100 pounds, but he's 100 pounds heavier on carcass weight. Now, this non-implanted steer at an equivalent days on feeds, a yield grade three, low choice with 750 pounds of carcass weight. And we're going to feed the cattle a little longer. Now we're a yield grade four on the non-implanted steer. He's still a low choice, and I'll tell you all about this in a second. And he's got 850 pounds of carcass weight. This implanted animal, by extending days on feeds, now reached yield grade three. He's fat, got enough fat on him. He grades choice, and he's still 100 pounds more carcass weight on him. So what does this mean? Well, one thing that I think is real cute is when people talk about what's going on with marbling. And, you know, I got to give credit to British influenced cattle. I don't want to dog the Angus breed. They have part of the reason to play on this. But the other part of the equation is that we just feed cattle to more advanced weights. So in my short career, I've been doing this as a faculty member for five years now. Uh, but from since I started graduate school, it's been about 10 years. Um, we've added more days on these cattle, all right? So when we used to ship cattle out at 1,300 pounds, I don't even call the packer till they weigh 1,500 pounds now, all right? And what happens when we do that is, you know, when I started grad school, we were probably trying to get har cattle harvested at four-tenths of an inch of rib fat. Well, now I'm shipping them at six-tenths of an inch of rib fat. And what we've really done when we see this massive improvement in the prime grade is all we've really done is allowed cattle with the genetic propensity to grade to achieve a rib fat thickness that allows them to express that quality grade. Okay, you don't feed a critter from a half inch of rib fat to one inch and pull him up from choice to prime. That's not how it works. But when you feed the whole population of cattle, we used to harvest them at four tenths of an inch, and now we harvest them at six tenths of an inch. When you got four tenths of an inch of rib fat on average, and you have a normal distribution, a bell-shaped curve, half the cattle are less than four-tenths of an inch of rib fat, half the cattle are more than four-tenths of an inch of rib fat. Now when you move to the right and harvest them at six-tenths of an inch of rib fat, well now all the cattle are above four-tenths of an inch of rib fat. And so the reason I show this slide here is because this is the percent choice at varying PYGs, or rib fat if you will, relative to the percentage choice. And once you get to five-tenths of an inch of rib fat, it goes flat. And so that's where you get the idea that feeding cattle longer doesn't make them go from choice to prime. It just pulls all the tail enders in the population up so that they can hit their genetic propensity for grade. This was supposed to be on this slide, but it didn't transfer good. Now there's one other study I want to talk about here. This was Wes Gentry's uh, dissertation that he did at South Dakota State under Pritchard. And they looked at frame size and implant. So he had two studies. Um, it was those same calves that came from that western South Dakota ranch. Uh, the study that Pritchard wanted to run got the middle cattle with the tight weight groups, and West got the tail enders. Uh, so West then, we knew the calves were from about a 60-day calving season. So we assumed that within that calving window, the smaller calves were, they, they could be younger, but they also could be different frame sizes. And so we had weight, and then we had the livestock judging coach and Wes go out there and assess their frame size and break them into larger or smaller framed cattle. Did two different implant strategies. It was either no implant versus sin of XS in one study, or a sin of excess versus a sin of X choice. Now, why did we do that? Well, by virtue of having trimbalone acetate in it, people oftentimes assume that a sin of X choice is a more potent implant than a sin of excess. 
but it's also got less estrogen in it. And this study was to look at estrogen effects on frame size. Well, there was no interaction between frame size and implant. So what does that mean? Simply put, it means that use of the anabolic agent of di differing anabolic agents can be applied similarly to cattle of different frame sizes. It's good. When we compared Cinevex S to Cinevex Choice, the Cinevex S cattle had greater intake. A very common phenomenon associated with application of estrogen is a good bump in intake. In cattle and in humans, estrogen will drive intake. Another thing is that they had greater AFBW, and that's weight at 28% empty body fat. And so while when they started this study, they thought that the choice implant was going to be the better implant in this study, it, by, by virtue of it having more TBA or containing trimbolone acetate, it really had no effect on the frame size change in those critters. So after this talk, Dale, I hope I did what you called me down here to do. We can go beyond the common practice of just straightening them out. And hopefully I illustrated that we can do more when we talk about managing growth during the backgrounding phase and how this can have very big implications on the total beef output put from a fixed land base, from your cow herd, from the crops that you grow and finish your cattle on. That's what I was trying to get at here. Now what's not clear from these data and will require further research is what energy balance is necessary as to not impede marbling development when we alter these growth rates. Now I'm not telling you all to go home and grow them at these growth rates because it is a little bit more, there's a little bit more to it than that. What, what it really is, is these were the growth rates that needed to be used in this class of cattle, in these steers. It's different if you go and try to pull this off in a Charlet or a Charlet Angus cross, so one half continental versus one that's a quarter continental. The calculation is actually based upon the fat content and their live weight gain. And if anyone's ever interested in that, I'm sure between someone in the state, uh, your extension personnel, we can help you figure out what that fat content and live weight gain needs to be to try to pull this off. And then another thing I think about here, especially with new regulations regarding re-implantation of cattle, I question whether we cannot go further and use management of caloric supply to effectively reset the mature weight of these cattle. And in the era of these new recommendations and GFIs coming down from the top, to me this seems compelling. Another thing when I'm trying to tie all this together, closer placement body weight to final shrunk body weight results in poorer feed conversion during the finishing phase. Age and body weight at placement are not easily known, but we got to use the stock men and stock women in us, all right? This is why I am thankful that I judge livestock in college, all right? Now, I, sometimes the judging kids drive me crazy because I, I, I'll go and quiz them. I'll be like, what's, uh, I'll be like, so, should a 1,700-pound steer win the county fair if he still looks really nice and balanced? You're like, no, he's way too big. And I'm like, well... I mean, if you don't take a carcass weight discount, he's probably the one worth the most money. And I used to not think that way, but it's just some food for thought. Proxy for how stretched out the cattle. Do we eyeball them? I eyeball them and use the calendar. I do have a little bit of intuition, I suppose. And then you just look at them. Does a thousand pound steer look like he should weigh a thousand pounds or 1300 pounds based upon his frame and how green they are? Changing the rate of growth up to the 65% of final shrunk body weight that alters the mature weight or the frame size and will enhance finishing phase growth performance. And cattle do not appear to be efficient converters when consuming a higher forage diet past about 70% of their final shrunk body weight. Here's the team. Uh, my pitcher didn't, uh, yeah, all my pitchers got pushed over to the next slide. Uh, that's a pretty cool sustainability thing. I, I guess I was trying to cover it with a picture of my kids. Um, I'm Zach, Feedlot Cattle Nutrition and Management. My colleague, Dr. Rushi, K-State alum, is our Extension Feedlot Specialist. Warren was actually, I was born the day that Warren was coming down to Manhattan to start his master's degree with Dr. Cora and Dr. Cochran. And Warren was my first PhD student. So I think that's a pretty, oh, Dr. Johnson said. <laughs> Zach, 
Paul Schlobel, Ruminant Nutrition Manager, Jason's our lab manager. Scotty Bird, we, uh, we, we uh, hijacked him from Minnesota. He came over to the Free State. And then my graduate students, Aaron, Chiago, Becca, Justin, Cassidy, Riley, Grace, and Forrest. This is a picture. Uh, there's, this is Aaron. Aaron's here. Uh, I'm going to put in a plug. Aaron's just accepted a job as our state beef extension specialist out West River. Very proud of her. This was in a day in February where there was no snow in the ground. And I was just the dumbest guy in America that told somebody we'd do them a water intake trial in February. We got lucky. This year, that wouldn't have happened. There was three foot of snow on the ground. An awfully fun group. We have a good time. And I didn't get the picture of us where we clean up, but I did have a nice picture of us all at a meeting where we were in our shirt and ties. Well, thank you all for having me here. And I, I am in the way of dinner, uh, but I will entertain any questions that you might have. Appreciate it.